uh, thanks for joining us today on this McGraw-Hill Education webinar, Math Assessment and the Common Core Standards. I'm Doug Cavalich with McGraw-Hill Education and I'll be moderating the session today. Uh, before we get started, just want to go over a few quick housekeeping items. The webinar is being presented in listen-only mode, which means you will be able to hear the presenter, but uh, he won't be able to hear you due to our size today. However, that doesn't mean you can't participate. Um, we want to hear any questions you have, so just type those in the questions box and we'll address those as we go along. Uh, joining us today is Jay McTie. He's an educational consultant who has served as director of the Maryland Assessment Consortium State Collaboration of School Districts Working Together to Develop and Share Formative Performance Assessments. Prior to this position, Jay was involved with school improvement projects at the Maryland State Department of Education, where he helped lead Maryland's standard-based reforms, including the development of performance-based statewide assessments. In addition to his work at the state level, Jay has experience at the district level in Prince George's County, Maryland, as a uh, classroom teacher, a resource specialist, and a program coordinator. Jay, welcome and thanks for joining us. Uh, thanks, Doug. Uh, good afternoon to everyone, or morning, depending on where you're located. I'm um, coming to you from snowy Baltimore. Uh, we haven't had as bad a winter as uh, New England and Boston area, but uh, there's snow in the ground, so hopefully you're in an area where the weather's not too, not too terrible. Um, I want to give an overview of this session, and I'm going to start with the key uh, topics that I hope to address during our hour or so together. Uh, briefly, I want to highlight, uh, sorry for the sound there, key features of the Common Core Standards for Mathematics. Um, I hope you know that this webinar will focus in particular on the Mathematics Standards. There are some unique and important features of the Common Core Standards that have impact or how we think about assessment, and I'll touch on those briefly. I want to look at the idea of assessment in the context of backward design. Some of you, I bet, are familiar with my work with Grant Wiggins on understanding by design, and uh, assessment plays an important role in that curriculum planning framework of UBD, and, and I'll briefly touch on that. Uh, I'm going to focus in particular on using performance tasks as a way of assessing both student knowledge of the math content, but more importantly, about their ability to apply the practices so that content and practice are fused and that we have, it, have evidence not only of their understanding, but their ability to apply and transfer their learning. Uh, finally, I have compiled a, what I think is a wonderful collection of resources that support uh, the kinds of assessment for mathematics that I'm um, advocating. And for some of you, this will be worth the price of admission to the webinar, uh, which is just to get this list. So I'll show you how to do that. We have also reserved a few minutes at the end of the webinar for questions and answers, although as Doug indicated, uh, as questions come up, you may uh, feel free to comp type those in on your screen, on the GoToWebinar uh, screen, and I will either address them as I can during the webinar or uh, perhaps during the Q&A session uh, toward the end. So even though our time is short, our topic is a big one, uh, one of the things that I um, typically do in presentations and I like to do in our webinar today is uh, Periodically during the course of the next hour, I'll pause a few times, and this gives you an opportunity, if you are viewing the webinar with anyone else, to have a little conversation with them. During these periodic pauses, which will be about two minutes in length, it's a chance for you to summarize what for you are key ideas from what you've heard, chance to add your own thoughts, how does this idea relate to your experience or your, um, your work. And if there are questions that come up from something I say or some of the examples, you might bring the questions up with your group mates and have a little conversation. Uh, if you are um, viewing the webinar by yourself, then this is a chance just to, to stop and reflect on what you've heard. And maybe if questions come up, you could type those in. Um, I have a little bell at my desk here. 
and so I will ring that at the end of the two minutes, which is a signal just to wrap up conversations if you are in groups. So let me begin with a look at the Common Core Mathematics Standards. The Common Core English Language Arts Standards include a, a main emphasis on helping students read what they refer to as, quote, complex texts, both literary and informational. And my view is that the Common Core Standards themselves are complex texts and demand a close reading. In fact, one of my strong recommendations, if you have not already done so, is to have an opportunity with your colleagues to read and discuss the Common Core Standards document. Moreover, I recommend that you start with the opening pages, because the opening pages really lay out the philosophy, the organizational structure, and the, and the overall intent of the standards. Sometimes those messages get lost if you simply dive into the grade level standards and look at the content that they list there. So I recommend a close reading of the opening pages and a discussion with colleagues so that, that everyone is clear about what's new in these standards, what are their emphases, uh, how are they different, and there is some difference to previous uh, math standards, et cetera. So I did a close reading of the math standards a couple years ago when they came out. And one of the things that I noticed was an attempt to address a problem that anyone who's been teaching for the last few years, if not longer, is fully aware of. And the image on the screen is suggestive. A teacher friend of mine actually sent me this, and she said, this is how I feel most days. And her intention was to symbolize curriculum overload, that there's so much content jammed into standards, and there's just not enough time it seems to teach it all the way we would like. Well, this has been a real problem in state standards in previous years, and to their credit, the mathematics, uh, the developers of the Common Core Math Standards attempted to address this head on. This is one of the items in the opening pages of the Common Core Standards. This is one of the first times I've ever seen in a curriculum document an acknowledgement of the problem that too often uh, standards list just too much, too much stuff. There's too much content in there. But how do you operationalize the idea of avoiding too much content and contributing to a mile-wide inch deep curriculum? Well, the opening pages of the standards go on to explain. that the focus in these standards, as I think many of you have recognized, is a commitment to focusing on a smaller number of larger ideas that recur across the grades. So whether we're talking about the concept of equivalence or mathematical modeling, we revisit important ideas and we go deep with them, as opposed to what is sometimes uh, seen as a superficial coverage of just lots of stuff. This is fully in line with research in cognitive psychology and increasingly from the neurosciences. Here is a favorite quote of mine from a wonderful book, How People Learn. This is not to say that basic skills aren't important. Of course, it, but it is to say that we want to focus our teaching and our assessment around larger ideas to see if students really understand them. So the content of the mathematics standards have been framed around recurring larger ideas, conceptual uh, ideas that we want kids to understand and should be taught accordingly. Separate, secondly, or connectedly, as you know, 
the mass standards have have added not just the list of content standards, but the mathematical practices. These highlight the ways of thinking uh, of a mathematician, including habits of mind, like perseverance. They focus on mathematical reasoning, and the expectation, if you read the opening pages, couldn't be clearer. The math standards expect teachers to not simply march through math content, but to engage students on a regular basis with the eight practices. This leads to an important idea in actually using the math standards. In fact, we can use the DNA symbol to suggest that the teaching of math standards should involve the integration of math concepts, especially focusing on recurring conceptual uh, themes and, and big ideas, uh, and fusing those with the math practices. At a practical level, this suggests a curriculum planning model that's actually quite old, suggested by Dr. Ralph Tyler in the 1950s, but couldn't be more appropriate to thinking about math curriculum today. Tyler, many years ago, said we need a matrix to plan our curriculum involving content and process. Looking at the math standards, then, it suggests that we actually create such a matrix and we plan our curriculum accordingly. The example on the screen, as you can note, comes from a math, uh, the third grade math standards, which are listed on the left side, and the eight practices across the top. If we were to shift grade levels, the vertical axis, of course, would, would change, but the math, math practices, of course, across the top would not. Then, therefore, as we're teaching and planning our curriculum, we want to ensure that both the content and the practices are regularly uh, and systematically addressed. And this has implications for how we think about the develop and, and, and use our assessments as well. And I will come to that uh, in just a moment. So before I go further, let me pause and uh, give you an opportunity just to comment on what you've heard thus far. The idea of the math standards trying to avoid mile-wide, inch-deep coverage to focus on a smaller number of recurring big ideas and the fusion of the math practices with the content standards. So I'm going to leave this on the screen but invite you for a two-minute uh, pause to talk with colleagues or make notes or ask questions uh, if you're by yourself.
Okay, I'm going to interrupt your two-minute pause. And I, I just noticed a typo on the example on the screen, which some of you have picked up. On the left side, midway through, there's a reference to analyze structure of text. That was an inadvertent cut-and-paste error from the ELA standard, so that should not be there. If you pick that up, you're a close reader. I compliment you. So I want to look at the idea of uh, uh, assessment as it relates to backward design. This was one of the key ideas of understanding by design. So a few comments, if, if I may, about understanding by design, UBD. Building a curriculum around the math standards in a way that would help develop and deepen students' understanding of the key ideas of mathematics and their ability to transfer their learning by using one or more of the math practices in conjunction with, with uh, content is a main emphasis in understanding by design and, and very aligned with the goals and the intent of the standards. Also, a big idea in understanding by design is to plan curriculum backward from these goals. And many schools and districts and individual teachers I worked with have used understanding by design as a framework for working with the Common Core Math Standards. So I'd like to highlight a key idea in UBD of stage one of backward design and then mer merge into assessment and its implications. Uh, in our most recent work with understanding by design, and our new planning template highlights this, Grant Wiggins and I proposed that there are three interrelated but not identical goals for any uh, teaching and any curriculum and we can apply them to the math standards. The one goal type involves acquisition, specifically of knowledge and skills. These are typically specified in the grade level standards. They, they articulate what students should know and be able to do, and we teach for acquisition. A second goal area is somewhat different. This is a focus on understanding. And the idea of understanding is not about knowledge, as in I know the multiplication tables, but understanding the conceptual idea of multiplication. A third related but not identical idea is transfer. And arguably, the Common Core math standards are calling for transfer. The ultimate goal is for students to be able to use their knowledge and skills with understanding so that they can apply the mathematics they're learning with the practices they are getting hopefully better at to new situations. In fact, arguably that's the best evidence of understanding. If you can apply your learning to something new to demonstrate that you not only know it, but you can transfer it. So I'd like you to keep these three goals in mind as we look at, at assessment of the standards. Before so doing, I want to give you just a quick example of one example of conceptual understanding. One of the big ideas in the math standards, of course, is mathematical modeling. It's not only a content idea, it's reflected in the practices. We want students to be able to model with mathematics. So what, in fact, then, do we want students to understand about mathematical modeling? Well, here are two examples. We want students, even from a young age, to recognize that mathematicians and statisticians uh, create models that help us understand the world and phenomena, and some uh, models are predictive in nature. A second understanding may be a little subtler, but, but very important. Like analogies in English, mathematical models may have limits. And so a model can both illuminate, but also, if we're not careful, distort or misrepresent. And thus, we have to view any mathematical or statistical model uh, with a bit of skepticism. Don't accept it just because it's straightforward and laid out. In Understanding by Design, we use essential questions to engage students in exploring, in this case, mathematical models 
and hopefully coming to develop and deepen those understandings. So I just wanted to provide just two examples of understandings and related essential questions. Now I'd like to think about transfer, and I'd like to think about transfer with respect to mathematics. We can think about the knowledge and skills listed in grade level standards as equivalent to knowledge and skills that kids on a sports team have to practice. And on any sport, they have to know the rules of the game, they have to practice the basic skills, and they learn both individual and team-based strategies. But everyone understands in athletics that the ultimate goal is to be able to use your knowledge, skills, and strategies in a game. And think about how the game differs from practice. Practice is often working on individual skills and drills, but the game requires you to put it all together. And my contention is the game in athletics is an example of a transfer task. The players have to put everything they've learned in practice into action in the game, and every game is different. The other team may line up differently than we practice, and we have to adjust. In the same way that adept problem solvers in mathematics will adapt their knowledge, their skills, to new problem situations, and they'll invoke the strategies that are going to be most helpful to them, including perseverance if they don't get it the first time. That's a long way of saying, I think the math, mathematics standards in, in large part are asking us to shift our practice from just covering isolated skills and facts in practice and, te and testing them in isolation to giving kids many opportunities to apply their knowledge and skills in game-like situations through authentic problems and tasks and projects. And the assessment implications of that are, are suggested. So let's look at how this fits in with backward design. I'm going to highlight stage one and two. Stage one of backward design for a curriculum planning uh, asks us to identify desired results. Well, the math standards have done that for us. They've identified the math content, but they've also identified the practices as desired results. So we need to think of those as the DNA or the matrix. We need to think of them as fused. Stage two of backward design is where we think about acceptable evidence. In other words, what assessment evidence Will we accept that shows that kids not only know the facts, not only are developing the skills, but are increasingly understanding the mathematics involved and are able to transfer it to new situations? In other words, we need evidence of those three goals, acquisition of facts and skills, conceptual understanding of larger ideas, and the ability to transfer or apply their learning to new situations. Our teaching plan in stage three is what do we do to get there? But I'm going to highlight stage two for right now. So a key idea in stage two is suggested by the analogy on the screen. When we think about assessment evidence, evidence is plural. So it suggests that we have a collection of evidence over time. And the photo album analogy is also suggested that the best assessments aren't a single snapshot. That gives us a moment in time picture of what students know and can do, but it's often incomplete. We need a photo album, a variety of pictures taken over time will give us a more complete portrait, if you will, or picture of students' uh, knowledge, skills, and understanding. So this is a basic principle. Good assessment is, involves multiple sources of evidence, not a single source. And good teachers I know do this routinely. They use quizzes and tests and maybe performance tasks, observations, 
uh, formative assessments, et cetera, to give them a body of evidence that helps them understand what kids know and can do and what adjustments in their teaching may be needed. A related point is that we have many types of assessments from which to gather evidence of learning. A few of these are on the screen. And so let's zero in on the question, how do we assess students against the Common Core Math Standards? Well, I think because we have varied goals, knowledge and skill goals, conceptual understanding goals, and transfer goals, we need a variety of types of assessments to fully assess uh, student learning of the standards. The following graphic is one that I found useful, and I hope you will, to think about the different kinds of assessments that we might use. As a general rule, I think traditional assessments, but particularly uh, quizzes where we give kids uh, math problems, often in a multiple choice format, uh, or tests or uh, skill checks, are useful for assessing discrete knowledge and skills. These are typically uh, not authentic or contextualized, but that's fine. They give us a quick snapshot of whether students can accurately multiply or whether they can uh, recognize and graph a, a linear equation. Other types of assessments would involve more performance where students are actually asked to apply their learning to some situation. Typically, of course, math word problems involve something of this sort. The best of those uh, involve transfer, i.e., the student's never seen the problem before, even though they've worked with the math concepts and skills. Also, performance tasks typically involve the HOTS, some, quote, higher order thinking skills are called for, whether it's problem identification, analysis, uh, some degree of mathematical reasoning, and so on. In other words, it's insufficient just to have memorized the formula and plug in the numbers in a mindless sort of way. Uh, the problems involve some degree of, of thinking. And a subset of the performance tasks are those that are set in an authentic context. These are what you might call, quote, real life applications of math. And they give us, in my view, evidence of understanding and the ability to truly transfer your learning in context. So the point here is straightforward. Just as we have different goals uh, in the math standards, we can and should have different assessments in our assessment photo album. The, the proportions of the graphic are also suggestive. The majority of our assessments are likely to be traditional. Uh, quizzes and, and, and straightforward tests to see if kids know and can do the basics. But I argue that we should also include in our assessment album performance tasks, including a subset of those that are really built around authentic problems. These are tasks that require transfer, higher order skills, and they are meant to assess uh, student understanding and ability to apply their learning. So I'm going to show you one other idea and then a pause before we look at uh, further examples. This is an idea that we recommend in Understanding by Design, and it's a way of checking to see if the assessments you're using are really well aligned to all the goals in the standards. So here's the way it works. Uh, by the way, on the screen is a, a screenshot of our planning template for stage two of backward design, where we think about assessment evidence. This is a unit planning framework, by the way, not necessarily for use for individual lessons. But think about a major unit of study. We propose that our assessment photo album would consist of assessments of two broad types, performance tasks, which require 
students to demonstrate their understanding and transfer, and at least some of those ought to be built around authentic problems. And the second category below, uh, we simply call other evidence. And this can be any and all other assessments used, including a test, a quiz, a skill check, observing kids while they work, having them do think alouds as they solve problems, and so on. So it's not either or. We're not talking about one type or the other. We're talking about a collection of evidence aligned with our goals. So here's where the technique comes in. Plan a unit of study. Identify the key content and skills from the standards, but also identify the math practices that you plan to really highlight. That's in stage one. Stage two now, you use this form or something like it to identify the assessments that you plan to use to assess students' knowledge and skills. And then here's how the technique works. You cover up stage one and only show your planned assessments for your unit to another teacher or a team and ask them to tell you just by looking at your assessments what they think your unit goals are and which of the math standards are being appropriately assessed. Do you see how that works? It's a really great check for alignment to make sure that what you say you're assessing or what you think you're assessing is well aligned with the various goals that you have in place. Somebody should be able to look at your assessments and see that one or more of the pra math practices are called for, even as they should be able to identify the content, uh, knowledge, and skills that you are assessing. So that was a lot to take in. Let me pause uh, one more time for a two-minute pause, give you a chance to, to comment or reflect on these key ideas. Okay, that's my bell to interrupt uh, the next pause. So I'd like to take a look now at some examples of assessments that I believe are the kind we need to use regularly to assess Common Core Math Standards. And I'm going to go back to my matrix idea and suggest that we actually look at the fusion of specific content with one or more of the practices as a means of deciding on the kinds of tasks uh, that we need. And we would, in fact, we could even map out the tasks across a unit or across the entire year to ensure that both the content and the practices are being uh, regularly assessed. So let us look at a few examples now of assessments uh, built around assessing both the practices and the, uh, the math content 
uh, from the standards. As we look at these, I ask you a couple of questions. Number one, do not only what content or skills are being assessed, but do you see ways in which these assessments would reveal degrees of student understanding and ability to apply or transfer their learning? Uh, secondly, do you see higher orders thinking required by the student as opposed to just kind of plug and chug that memorization is all you need? Thirdly, I ask you to look at the context, to what extent are at least some of these set in a more authentic real world context? And finally, would these be tasks worth teaching to? In other words, if you want kids to do this kind of task, then you plan backward from it in terms of your instruction and what kind of instruction would these call for. Okay, so let's look at some samples. Uh, here's one. I would describe this as a generic assessment applicable to almost any concept or process at any grade. It's something we know as teachers. If you want to teach, if you want to see if someone understands something, have them teach it or explain it to someone else. It's hard to explain something well that you yourself don't understand, and thus it becomes an effective assessment, particularly of understanding. Uh, here's a task involving application. Content, of course, is area and perimeter. And notice the task doesn't simply have kids give a number or draw a picture. The second part asks them to explain their reasoning, which is a key practice. It's an interesting, somewhat open-ended task. Tied, interestingly, to science concept. Here's an exam example involving mathematical reasoning. Uh, here's an authentic task tied, of course, to uh, something that interests many uh, middle and high school students. So these are a few examples of relatively short tasks that nonetheless require some degree of transfer application and reveal degrees of student understanding. One of the things that I've been interested in for some time is the idea of what I'll call task frames. The task frames are somewhat generic in nature, but you can populate them with content or examples that bring them to life. Here's a, one example of a task frame on the screen. So let's look at this played out by second grade teachers. Um, they have a practice, uh, these are two second grade teachers I met, who um, Every year, the first week of school, they measure the height of their kids and they record the heights. Then each month thereafter, the kids measure each other. And in so doing, they're learning the skills of measurement, they're learning to use the different tools of measurement, 
they're learning how to record numbers, including at half uh, or you know fractional intervals, since we don't grow in one inch increments. As the year goes on, the teachers introduce charts and tables because we have a lot of numbers now. How are we going to keep track of them? And toward the end of the year, uh, or at the end of the year, the last month, they then uh, teach the kids how to create da uh, data displays and to interpret the data they've collected. And the culminating performance task is summarized on the screen. So interestingly to me, in a developmentally appropriate way, they're engaging kids in the big ideas of mathematical modeling. One teacher even said she's going to have the kids look at their line of growth and ask what would happen if it continued all the way to seventh grade. Because she said potentially we could see eight, eight, eight foot tall seventh graders if our line continued straight which is a beautiful case of getting them to question whether the line continues forever. In other words, is there a limit to this mathematical model of our height of growth in second grade? Here is the same task frame applied by a high school teacher. And think about this applied to something like measles today. By the way, just as an aside, there's a great website, if you don't already know about it, it's on my list, which I'll show you, from Tuva Labs, T-U-V-A. They have a wonderful collection of data sets, real-world data sets that can be used in a variety of ways uh, with mathematics and, and science uh, as well. Finally, I just want to wrap up the examples with a particularly clever task developed by a ninth grade teacher uh, doing an un introductory unit on statistics focusing on measures of central tendency. I thought this was brilliant. And the teacher told me that his students' interest in learning about measures of central tendency went way up when he gave them the option of uh, having their grade calculated by one of the three methods. So my contention is we should center our assessments of the Common Core math standards around rich tasks of this sort, of these sorts. And we should supplement our assessments with more traditional tests and quizzes of discrete knowledge and skills. Just like in athletics, we need both. But one by itself is incomplete. You may be saying, well, these tasks are interesting, but how do we evaluate student performance on them? Doesn't this get too subjective? Well, in my view, it doesn't have to. It, but what it does suggest, of course, is that we have a well-developed rubric or set of criteria to use uh, in evaluating student performance. This is uh, a rubric that I have developed uh, reflective of some of the good work from exemplars. and. Um, it's a generic rubric in the sense that you could use it uh, to evaluate student performance on different types of problems. Uh, moreover, you could use it across the grades. And that's something that I recommend as well. While there's a place for task-specific rubrics, it's my position that the math practices continue across the year and across the grades, and the qualities that we look at in student work on problems should similarly span across the grades. I'm not proposing a K-12 to single rubric, but I am proposing a rubric that might be agreed to by high school or even secondary, middle and high school teachers, such as the one you see on the screen, with a less sophisticated version for younger kids, so that every teacher is looking at student work 
at least around rich, authentic problem solving and reasoning through the same lens. Kids get to know the evaluative criteria and uh, there's consistency as opposed to each teacher uh, judges students in his or her own way and it varies from teacher to teacher. That's not a coherent uh, assessment system. So a couple of ideas before a pause. I recommend that we map our curriculum not simply around the content of mathematics but about around the kinds of performances we want kids to be able to do with the math they're learning. Hence I recommend that we map out the curriculum around rich problems and performance tasks, many of which are set in authentic contexts. The photograph on the screen is from a group of middle school teachers who worked in a project where they developed rich performance tasks and now they are getting together to look at student work on the tasks. This is what, as you know, a PLC team does, a professional learning community. They get together to unpack the standards, to read, do a close read of the opening pages, to map out their curriculum, and then to get together to look at student work that develops or results from the tasks that they give. Here is a format that I've used with such groups and it's it actually has three boxes for space reasons I, I, can, I dropped the top box but if you can envision a top box that that says based on an analysis of student work what patterns of strength are noted and what areas of improvement have we seen? So we want to start with strengths and growth. Then we identify patterns of weakness as we collectively examine student work, in this case, work on authentic problems. And finally, as a group, as a PLC group, we share our best ideas for how to improve. Notice in this example, the specificity both in the weak areas that the teachers noticed and similarly the specificity of their planned actions. This is what I believe is needed to individually and collectively help us improve student learning. But we can't get the benefits of a, a team, a professional learning community, if we don't have some common agreed upon tasks to look at. And I propose that the, the best and richest assessments are authentic performance tasks, not isolated items that just evaluate individual skills. I'm going to wrap up with a format for a rubric that I'd like to show you if you haven't already seen this. Because as we think about assessment in the larger sphere, it's not simply a process by which we get grades only. Of course, that's one prominent role of assessment, evaluation and grading. But ideally, our assessment should inform everyone, including the student. So notice on this graph, there are two graphic elements, one of which is highlighted at the bottom. You notice the little uh, cells within the cells on the analytic rubric. This can be used for student self-assessment, something that I and many others recommend. And so some teachers are in the habit of giving students this kind of rubric, and they are asked to self-assess before they turn their work in. In fact, they turn their work in with the rubric. Here is a hypothetical example that a student might turn in. Now, the teacher is obviously, uh, and importantly, the main evaluator. And it might be that the student's self-assessment is not in line with yours, in which case this is a good opportunity to talk with the kid and find out what they're thinking and help them recognize that 
uh, and maybe it wasn't as good as they thought, or in some cases wasn't as bad as they thought, because sometimes kids are hard on themselves. But the idea being when the assessment is returned, we would ask the students, in fact expect the students to identify some goal or, or specific action that they will take to improve their performance next time. And this to me is a simple way of transforming a rubric from simply an evaluation or grading tool to a tool for, that includes self-assessment and goal setting. So I'm going to, oh, by the way, here is an example of a student in a school who's actually doing this thing, this very thing. This is not a math example, but it's illustrative of the idea. He has a rubric right next to him, and he is self-assessing against a set of criteria. So I'm going to wrap up with uh, anticipating potential concerns, and I want to show you a great list of websites and how to get them. Some of you may be thinking, or some of your colleagues may say to you, eh, I hear what McTy is saying, and this is all well and good, but we have state tests now, and they don't test this way. They're multiple choice. They don't give authentic problems. They don't use rubrics. There's a right or wrong answer. So why, why can we do this, or why should we do this? Well, there's a lot to say about uh, current standardized tests and the new con the new round coming from Parker Smarter Balance, but I'll simply make the following assertion: I think the best way of preparing for any external standardized test is to teach and assess for understanding and transfer, and to use more traditional assessments of discrete knowledge and skills as means to those ends in the same way that the coach coaches for the game, not for individual drills in athletics. Those of you who have done test score analyses are well aware that the most widely missed items on most standardized tests today, not to mention the forthcoming Park or Smarter Balance tests, which will be more challenging, the most widely missed items on today's standardized tests in mathematics are items that require mathematical reasoning, and multi-step problem solving. Even though they may be multiple choice in nature, they are not low level. Quick example. This was the most difficult item on a recent uh, state test from New York, high school mathematics. And the New York state assessments are regarded as one of the more challenging assessments of state assessments in the U.S. Fewer than 30% of all 10th graders correctly answered this question, even though it was multiple choice in nature. Now, when you look at the item, you can see it's an item that involves the Pythagorean theorem, a, a topic routinely taught in high school mathematics. So if this is such a common topic, why would so few kids get it? Well, here's my hypothesis. There's no cues given in the problem. It doesn't tell you to use the Pythagorean theorem. You've got to understand the theorem and its use sufficiently to invoke it. Secondly, this to me is a case of students' failure to transfer their learning. They may know the Pythagorean theorem, and they may be able to solve a one-step problem where you plug in the numbers, but they weren't able to apply it even to this fairly simple, albeit multi-step uh, problem. And so from an assessment point of view, it raises the question, do they really understand the Pythagorean theorem if they can't do a simple application like this? The analogy that Grant Wiggins and I use is suggested on the screen. We think that educators with all good intentions sometimes reveal a misconception when they think the best way of raising test scores is to practice the item format. That confuses the measures with the goals. And it would be like practicing for your physical exam to get healthy. The best way of practicing for the math standards and any assessments of them is to honor the standards and teach and assess not only for discrete knowledge and skills, but for understanding and transfer. And the best assessments of those involve authentic, 
performance tasks supplemented by other more traditional assessments. So that's my story and I'm sticking to it. Now I will be happy to entertain questions if there are any. I haven't seen any posted, but uh, before that I want to leave you with a couple of resources. Skip this. Uh, one resource is a book that I wrote last year. It's an ebook and it focuses on the development and use of these kinds of rich performance assessments. It's published by the School Improvement Network. And uh, I will ask the webinar folks to send you a link where you can preview it. But it has lots of examples as well as design tools for creating such rich tasks. Uh, I think it's one of the best books on assessment, but I'm biased, so I'll be a critical thinker around that, around that statement. Okay, here's the last part of what I want to share with you. On my website, which you can find at my name, jmctie.com, C-O-M, uh, here's where you can get some what I think are wonderful resources to support this kind of math assessment. So if you go to my website and then go to resources right at the top, click on the resources link, you will come to, oops, you'll come to this page. And on this page, there are a number of resources, but the one I want to highlight is uh, symbolized by a globe icon. So you click on the globe icon, and there are a number of resources that you could access, but the one that fits this webinar is the third one down, Websites to Support Performance Task Design. Click on that, and let me, oops, let me go to my screen. Oh, what happened? Here we go. And here is what you can download. This is a seven page list of websites that I've found and teachers have recommended to me that have great practical pr tried and, and proven resources that can be used to assess the common core standards. Many of these include um, authentic tasks, problems, rubrics, and with only one exception, in fact, uh, exemplars, which I'm highlighting now, all of these are free of charge. Exemplars, as you may know, is a uh, paid subscription, but a wonderful collection of tasks and rubrics with annotated student samples, which is unique. Uh, tied to Common Core Standards. So as I'm hoping, uh, for some of you this will be worth the price of admission and I encourage you to check out these great uh, resources. If you uh, have uh, websites of this sort that are not on my list but that you have found useful, I would be indebted to you if you would uh, email this to me. My email is on my website. Uh, also, uh, if you find any that have changed or sometimes the websites uh, change the URL, if you notice that, let me know and I'll I do an update periodically. I've also, finally, at the end of this list, included some great websites for STEM. So some of you, I suspect, are involved in STEM education and there are uh, some great websites for you there. And uh, pages six and seven include uh, rubric resources uh, that are uh, separate but specific uh, for rubrics. So that is our webinar. I hope that you found uh, the hour worth your time. I hope it gave you some good practical ideas and I hope you will explore the resources. And I want to thank McGraw-Hill for uh, sponsoring our event today. Thanks, Jay. Um, we actually have a couple of uh, questions here that we can get to uh, that, that have come in. And maybe you answered a couple of them, so just stop me if you did. But um, Summer's asking, are there rubrics for teachers and students on the eight mathematical practices available? Uh, that's a great question, Heather. Uh, quite frankly, I haven't seen, I haven't seen those. 
uh, per se. I would love to know if there are, and maybe some, one of the other viewers does and, and could communicate that, but I think that would be a natural next step for the Common Core Standards or a related math group to do. It would be a great national resource. Thanks for answering that. Um, one in here, uh, same person. What does uh, GRASPS stand for? Uh, uh, GRASPS is an acronym that we use in Understanding by Design uh, as, a, as a means of creating a more authenticity and a, and a more authentic real world context around performance tasks. So um, permit me very quickly to give you an example. Um, the G in GRASPS is the goal. The R is a role for the student. The A is an audience. The P is the product or performance that they'll make. And the S is the standards by which their work will be judged. So if you look at the example on the screen, the audience is your friend. The, the situation, that, that's the first S by the way, the situation is the cell phone plan comparison. Your, the role for this case is yourself. So it's not imagine you're a surveyor or a taxi driver finding the, the quickest route around the city or an astronomer doing the solar system modeling. Uh, it's yourself. The product in this case is simply an explanation. Although some tasks, they might create a model or they might uh, develop an equation. There may be a product. And then the standards essentially would be the rubric that you have um, accurately evaluated the plans, explained your reasons, and had some representation either through a graphic or an equation that will present and summarize uh, your recommendation to your friend. Okay, Greg, uh, Doug, any other questions for the good um, of the order? No, there's several questions that he answered all at once there with the, with a couple of those comments. Um, we're kind of out of time, but I wanted to say thanks, Jay, again, for, for joining us and everyone who attended the webinar. Thank you so much. We're going to be sending a, a follow-up email so you can have a recording of this to review at any time. And um, if you have any questions for us, uh, our email is webinars at mheducation.com. And of course, you can reach Jay through his website if you have questions for him. Um, uh, and there is a brief survey on the way out of the webinar we'd appreciate you guys to take on the way out. Um, but thank you, Jay, and uh, thank you, everyone, for joining us.